and ticks. What do we really know about them, apart from being old and beautiful to look at? These objects are a window into people's lives, like a time machine. Đi suốt cả một chiều dài lịch sử. Who made it? What did it mean to them? Why did they make it this way? What's happened to it since the day it was made? Kể cả mảnh vỡ, nó cũng nói lên được tiếng nói của cái thời kỳ, của cái văn hóa ở vùng miền nào đó. There's an endless amount of information there to be learned. This beautiful stone earring is of Dongsun women back in 2000 years ago. A farmer found this under the mud near the capital city of Hanoi. Now at that time, Dongsun women would just put it onto their ears like this and it will hold on to their ears by itself. Now what's more, if you want to learn more about antics like this, well, Join us in this episode of Expert Living as we're about to meet with Mark Rappaport, a dedicated antique researcher and a collector from the U.S. who possesses a massive collection of antiques that are typical for 54 ethnic groups of Vietnam. I'm sure today we'll get to listen to a lot of interesting stories behind these antiques, but first let's go learn more about our collector Mark. Mark Rappaport first came to Vietnam for two months as a volunteer medical worker in 1969. Although most of his work was in a hospital for Vietnamese civilians in Da Nang City, he did some work in ethnic villages in other central provinces. At that time, he acquired an interest in the culture and art of these groups. When I went up to the, those villages in the Central Highlands, people were living the way they did hundreds of years ago. Um, and it was just fascinating. It was a, like a time machine. Um, I'm a collector. I collected baseball cards and postage stamps and all when I was young. And I, I see the objects as a window into a culture. Not just the object as something beautiful or perfect, but who made it? What did it mean to them? Why did they make it this way? What's happened to it since the day it was made? And all of those kinds of questions, some people call it the backstory. His interest encouraged Mark to return to Vietnam, and when his wife had a job offer for a project in Vietnam, the Rappaports moved to Vietnam in 2001. Since then, Mark has put together a large collection of antiques and arts from Vietnam's 54 ethnic groups. Uh, my initial interest was in the, the, the tribal things, the things from the ethnic minorities. They all came here from someplace else, so you have in the, the groups in the north. You have vestiges of the, their culture in China and the culture of China around them. In the Central Highlands, those groups came from Indonesia and a long time ago, a thousand years. So their background is very different. The same object will be different, will in some ways be similar in every group, in other ways will be different among them. So there's an endless amount of information there to be learned. As his collection reached some 15,000 objects, Mark decided to open a gallery to share his treasures with the world. Together with a Vietnamese business partner, Mark established 54 traditions. Here, Mark selects the most excellent samples from his collection and then cleans, prepares, and mounts or frames each object as a museum would. The first room focuses on the things from the Central Highlands. The second room focuses on shamanism. And then the next room is functional objects, jewelry and things for growing rice and all, with some religious things as well. The next room is all textiles, uh, almost all from the minority groups. And the last room has some jewelry that my business partner makes up, small bits of ancient history that have been mounted in a way that can be worn by a woman or a man, uh, and also some of the small uh, things made out of stone or bronze or ceramics from the, the Viet, the King people, but going back hundreds of years. So I mentioned that I like things that don't necessarily have to be fancy. Mark offers a tour around his five-story gallery for anyone who wishes to buy or to see his acquisite antiques. He also provides written documentation of the identification, age, purpose, iconography, and background of each object. I'm less concerned with the number of years 
than with the backstory behind it and how much it is a part of the culture it came from. And those things come with a sheet of usually a thousand words, sometimes two or three or four or five thousand words, telling people everything about them. I want them to understand it. I want them to get interested not just in the object, but in the people who made it and used it. So. Among the thousands of his objects, Mark is especially interested in those used by shamans in the northern mountains. This is one of the many tools that they use, and these are not just used by one group, but a number. This is, uh, represents Pan Hung, who's a, a mythical beast. Many, some of the tribes think it's their ancestor, and it's part dragon, part tiger, part dog. So if you look at this one, it's almost all dragon. And this one is kind of all dog. dog and this yeah. one's almost all tiger. tiger yeah. This one's a bit of each. It has the scales of a dragon. Uh, it has kind of the mouth of a dragon, mm -hmm. but the shape of a, of a dog or a tiger, tiger and kind of a doggy dog, tail. Yeah. In the shaman's hands, it has the power to make things holy. Mm -hmm. Either a book, which can then be used for religious ceremonies, or they have their own version of ghost money. Mm -hmm. I mean, here in Hanoi, mm -hmm. uh, people will burn fake U.S. $100 bills to their ancestors, up in the mountains, they'll use something like this to, to print their own. It has the four, this has six sides, but it has four messengers. Each of them drives a different animal, and they take prayers to heaven. These antiques have taken Mark a lot of time and effort to collect, and they often make it to his gallery in various ways. I like best when objects find me rather than the other way around. In certain situations, I'll go out and say, what do you have that's old, basically? But if I'm going to a village and people, you know, they ask me to sit and have dinner or they, you know, want me to go out and look at their fields, then in the course of that, things turn up. A very old spoon used to serve dinner, a very unusual tool that, you know, one minute ago was in the mud being actually used to transplant rice, but that's a thing that appeals to me. With its centuries-old history of pottery making, Bachan Ceramic Village is an attractive destination for antique researchers and collectors like Mark uh, to visit. And today I'll be accompanying Mark to this village and let's see if we can find any interesting antique among all the new things. Good. Let's go. Let's go. Situated on the bank of the Red River, about 10 kilometers from the center of Hanoi, Bat Chiang is the most renowned ceramic village in northern Vietnam. Although many new modern techniques have been applied here in the making of ceramic products, touches of the past are still present. The things I liked in Bat Chiang were the things that were echoes of past traditions. I like a tea set like this because it builds on Vietnamese tradition very strongly. Hmm. The, the inside, white or ivory, oh. and the brown outside, Vietnamese people have been making this combination since the 14th century. 14th century? So six or seven hundred years. So they still apply this technique Right, nowadays. and it's very pleasing. Yeah. Uh, the white, you I can love see the what you're eating, and this is a very strong color. After a tour around the ceramic village without finding anything, Mark and I decided to pay a visit to artisan Tô Thanh Xuân's house. Mm. Oh, hello, Mark. Xin chào. Rồi, rất vui được đón này. Nice to meet you. Rồi, rồi, rất vui. Rồi hôm nay sẽ là chúng ta sẽ có những cuộc trò chuyện về cái yêu thích của chúng mình, đó là chúng cái thú chơi đồ cổ, nhất là đồ cổ Việt Nam. Xin mời bạn. Xin mời bạn. Following the footsteps of past ceramics workers, artisan Tu Thanh Sơn is one of the most experienced pottery makers in Bát Chiang. He's also well known for his acquisite collection of rare ceramic antiques with thousands of objects. Although this is the first time they've met, Mark and Sơn immediately find many common interests. The 
part, the kind of thing that I like especially that we've talked about, the white on the inside and the blue, the brown with these spots. And that's what looks like this. Thời Lý Trần. From Lý Trần Dynasty. Yes. Một trong những cái bát lành, không có nứt, không bị sứt vỡ. Đấy là những cái thú chơi của tôi. And that's so, rare because it is yeah, uh, 700 years, years old. Bởi vì nó khoảng 7, 6 đến 700 tuổi mà bác sưu tập được những cái đồ như thế này rất là quý. Như thế này. And they only started doing no design. Có lẽ cái văn hóa gốm là đi suốt cả một chiều dài lịch sử. Kể cả mảnh vỡ nó cũng nói lên được tiếng nói của cái thời kỳ, của cái văn hóa ở vùng miền nào đó. Khi xưa đi cấy lội bùn cho nên là lạnh, văn hóa lúa nước cho nên là lạnh thì thì đã phải nhai trầu. Người miền Trung thì uống nước mắm. And even though all over Asia they chew beetle, Mm. Only in Vietnam do they have that kind of bowl with the handle on it. Yeah. That's only Vietnam. Bộ siêu tập này của tôi cũng là lành. Một trong những cái món đồ gốm mà thế giới siêu tầm đồ cổ yêu thích thì đó là những cái bình hán. Nên là những cái bình hán ngày xưa công dụng thì có những người nói rằng là họ sẽ để cho cốt này để tùy tháng đấy để tìm được những cái bình hán lành như tôi đang có thì cũng có thể nói là cũng là rất là công phu. Chúng mình lên uống trà nhé, không lạc vào đây là sẽ... <cười> ok, <cười> ok. <cười> những món đồ này là tôi rất là tâm đắc và tôi rất thích. Có cái à. câu chuyện nào ở đằng sau những cái đồ vật này không ạ? This is the this very Vietnamese the style just like that as opposed to the Chinese. <cười> những cái nét phóng khoáng, bay bổng của gốm của những nước khác lại không bằng của Việt Nam chúng tôi. Thí dụ như những con cá, con chim, rồi khóm khoai, rồi con chuồn, nó thô thôi. Vượt lên trên tất cả thì đó là nó mang được những cái hoa văn, họa tiết của tâm hồn Việt. Đấy là cái thú vị nhất. He has some wonderful examples. You know, I've seen things like this in books, but it's very hard to find them out in the world. He has them because his family's been here and that's wonderful. Thật là thú vị đấy. Một con người này rất là thú vị. Có thể nói là cái niềm yêu gốm là ở ông Mắc thể hiện rất rõ. Tức là khi mà ông ta nhìn thấy những món đồ là tay ông ta muốn được ôm lấy nó, muốn được sờ lấy nó. Đấy là cái cảm giác đầu tiên, bởi vì cái cảm giác ấy chỉ có những người yêu đồ gốm mới có được. Thế và sau khi làm đạo thì tôi thấy rằng là có lẽ là ông ta cũng mất rất nhiều thời gian để đọc sách, để nghiên cứu. Tôi rất vui mừng để được gặp, được làm bạn với những con người như vậy. Most interesting thing of that day, in retrospect, was to see his passion. Yes, he's making modern things for the market but he also collects the things from a long time ago and some of the things that he liked best were some of the things that I liked best. So he was a, he was a great, he was the biggest treasure uh, for sure. But today isn't just about having a chance to meet someone who shares his passion. Mark has also received one meaningful antique for his collection. Giờ đây thì ít người sử dụng cái loại bình vôi này. Nhưng sự hiện diện của bình vôi ở trong gia đình đó là sự chấn tà thể hiện sự ý chí sự vươn lên. Hôm nay một chút quà nhỏ này xin được tặng ngài. Thank you so much. It's beautiful. While Mark does not just collect antiques for himself and for his gallery, he has also donated a large number of antiques to various museums in the U.S. and in Vietnam also, including the Vietnam Museum of Ethnology and the Vietnamese Women Museum, where we are right now. Numerous objects have been donated to this museum by Mark and his gallery. Among them, many are rare, such as these old rice cutters. I think we probably gave them, it's a couple of years now, about 75 things. Some were functional objects, things that were used for purposes, like the rice harvesting knives. And I like those a lot because it's a very simple tool, but the people make an effort to make it beautiful, carving it in the shape of an animal usually. And also some of the textiles, uh, 
It's so much a part of the identity, especially of women, and also some of the jewelry. These have to do with the desire to have a family, to have a child. And these are from two of the groups that live in uh, Tai Nguyen, north and east of Hanoi. And this is called the Flower Bridge. And you, have the, you see the couple praying for a child. And the child is sent from heaven. All of these uh, saints help it get across. And then they're usually rewarded by it. This is the palace of the midwives in heaven. And that's the chief midwife. Here the baby is waiting babies, to be born. Yeah. And all the ladies will have different roles in making sure the baby comes into this world mm -hmm. safe and happy and the mother does well as, as well. These Shet paintings are all own, owned by the shaman. And these are put out for a while. The ceremonies are done. Then they're rolled up again and oh. stored for the next time the shaman uses them. So how old are these pictures? 100 years, 100 80 years, years, 1910, 1920. It's amazing that we can still keep the color very vivid mm -hmm. and even the details are very sharp and clear. Right? right. This is actually an amazing thing that the bride... And actually, I've been inviting the bride is hidden. It's interesting. Certainly the best that item anyway. should be available to the public and also should be in okay. Vietnam. When I come to a museum and I, I see things that I've donated, it makes me feel good. It's, it's a pleasure in a lot of ways. Not only Mark feels good, many visitors to the museum also share that feeling after seeing these objects. What I learned is uh, those, uh, those clothes, uh, those hats that we see here, it, are, it gives identity to the people, identity to the women of the people. I think it's very important to collect uh, these things and to keep this for, for history. People share my passion and that's good. Hanoi, the city of peace. This is where Mark has resided for the last 15 years after traveling some 70 countries around the world. What in Hanoi, besides the antiques, have made him stay? Well, there aren't just one or two reasons. Mark has 101 reasons to love living in Hanoi. This is also the name of a book that Mark has published in 2010. The lakes. Hanoi is a city of lakes, dozens of them, many surrounded by parks and walks. Well, that's reason number six, as you wrote, um, to love living in Hanoi, right? Yes, and it's a benefit 24 hours a day. It's a great place to start the day, exercising and all. It's a wonderful place to take a break for lunch in the middle of the day. And at the end of the day, to sit as we are, having some fruit juice or some coffee, it's a nice way to wind down the day. So why did you decide to make a list of the reasons why you love living in Hanoi in the first place? I grew up in a generation when, at least in the view of our government, our, our two countries were at war. So people said, why would you want to live there in comparison to any place else? And so I said, well, I like the people and all. But after a while, people wanted a more complete answer. So I started to put together the reasons, and it got longer and longer and longer. And then one day, um, Colonel Howe from the Military Veterans Publishing House showed up in my gallery and said we'd like to make it into a book in honor of the thousandth anniversary of Hanoi. And I was honored and I'm proud of the things I said. It's all the truth. So you didn't intentionally write a book in the first place, but it's just like more like a list of your experience. Right? No, that was never the idea. Yeah. Uh, but once he did it, then it was fun working on it. So what do you want your readers to, to get from this book? I want it to be a window into uh, a city, the city's people, and kind of their, their hearts. I'm very biased. I think Vietnamese people are the best people in the world. There's an honesty, that is an openness. There's a family attitude. There's a hard work, which are all the things you'd hope to see in a society that's functioning, that's moving ahead, that has a sense of itself. Now, of all the 101 reasons why you love living in Hanoi, can you choose out the reason that you like the most? 
I think I'd start with number one, the people. The people? That's the people. Most friendly, most honest, warmest folks anywhere. Here I felt that you're accepted as a visitor and accepted as someone who lives here. Yeah, Here's number the two. Here's second one. Again, the people. Hardest working, least complaining, most optimistic folks anywhere. This is, a, this is a working city. People here understand you have to work to keep your family alive, and they just do it, right? And they do it with a sense of humor and a sense of responsibility and uh, a sense of integrity. Not just in high-level fancy jobs, but in jobs that, that keep the city moving, cleaning the streets or, or anything else. So street food inside a restaurant doesn't taste the same. That sociability of just people sitting on the street and interacting with, with one another, you don't see in many places. When you knew your neighbors and you talked to your neighbors and you knew the people who were a lot older than you were a lot younger than you. And that you see in Hanoi um, all the time. Here the streets are a place themselves. Now some people say this is the old Hanoi. It's changed a little bit. And it changes, and it changes very rapidly. But the essence of what makes this a wonderful place doesn't change. Well, we just met with Mark Rappaport, a passionate antique collector, and discovered his massive collections of antiques from all 54 ethnic groups of Vietnam. Well, uh, collecting is obviously many people's hobby. So what about yours? What do you want to do in your free time? Well, in our next segment of Time Out, our reporter will give you one suggestion. As little kids, we all wanted to become our favorite movie characters like Captain America, Superwoman, Jedi, Harley Quinn. And so, some even took the childhood dream into the adult's life. This was first called Cosplay by manga publisher Takahashi Nobuyuki in 1984. Since then, cosplay has grown exponentially as a global hobby. You may have known of the awesomeness of your cartoon character as well as how extravagant they could be. So why don't you actually become one of them yourself? This brings us to our cosplay shop here at Soulmate where we learn how to become a cosplayer in this edition of Time Out. Founded in 2009, Soulmate's cosplay shop is among many headquarters for Hanoi cosplayers since the culture's emergence in Vietnam. Here you can find everything a cosplayer needs from costumes, makeup, wigs, to weapons. For around 30 bucks, you can turn yourself into your fantasy hero. The best way to learn how to become a cosplayer is to actually be one of them yourselves. And today I get to do that with the help of our experts. For... So hi, um, chào bạn. Bạn có thể uh, giới thiệu cho mình là đến với cosplay thì đầu tiên chúng ta cần những gì được không? À, đầu tiên điều quan trọng nhất là bạn phải lựa chọn nhân vật yêu thích của mình. Bởi vì để, để cosplay hết thần thái của nhân vật thì việc đầu tiên là bạn phải yêu thích nhân vật đấy và bạn phải hiểu về nhân vật đấy. Ngoài ra thì một nhân vật có thể có rất nhiều bộ trang phục khác nhau. Lúc đó bạn sẽ phải xem và bạn lựa chọn những trang phục phù hợp với mình nhé. And my character is Naruto, a resilient ninja who is kind and determined to follow his dream no matter what. The franchise, the same name, achieved gross profit of 10.8 million US dollars. Đầu tiên bạn phải nghiên cứu về nhân vật trước. Cosplay điểm quan trọng nhất là bạn phải giống nhân vật đấy càng giống càng tốt. Bạn sẽ phải xem các cái tra rồi xem các cái phim hình cũng như các cái hình ảnh để bạn có thể nhìn được cái bộ trang phục từ mặt trước mặt sau.
So now that we've got the costume ready, what's really important right now is we get the accessories done. And with the accessory of my character, Naruto, we have the kunai. And to help me do that, we have our weapon expert, uh, Phúc. OK, yeah. so uh, bạn có thể uh, chỉ cho mình cái cách làm như thế nào để bạn có thể làm được một cái kunai cho Naruto không? Với một uh, dụng cụ nhỏ như kunai này và làm từ, tùy theo mức độ chi tiết thôi, thì mình nghĩ là khoảng từ 1 đến 2 tiếng đồng hồ. Thường thì ở Việt Nam mình uh, dùng những cái phụ kiện đi từ những cái vật liệu rất đơn giản thôi, rất là dễ mua, mua chỉ tất kẻ và dao dọc giấy. Mình uh, sẽ vẽ lên hình dáng trên tấm format này. Mình sẽ cắt nó ra. mài bóng và cuối cùng là sơn mình sẽ bổ sung thêm những cái phụ kiện cần thiết nữa ví dụ như là mình cần quấn dây da vào này So makeup is actually an essential part of becoming a cartoon character like Naruto and today I have the help of our makeup artist Hao who will be showing us how to become Naruto through makeup Uh, chào Thảo, vậy thì uh, Thảo có thể nói cho mình là để biến hóa thành Naruto thì uh, bạn phải dùng make up như thế nào được không? Uh, Naruto thì có một cái đặc điểm rất là đặc trưng đấy là anh ta có hai cái ria, ba cái ria ở bên này Và khi mà cosplay mỗi nhân vật nào thì điều quan trọng nhất là bạn phải có một lớp nền rất là mịn màng Bởi vì là nhân vật trong truyện tranh thì ai cũng có một làn da rất là đẹp Cái phần mắt rất là quan trọng bởi vì là nó sẽ tái tạo lại cái hình ảnh mà bạn đang uh, bạn cosplay cái nhân vật đấy Kẻ mắt sẽ rất là đậm và có thêm một cái đường mí giả trên này Cái lông mày sẽ phải cùng màu với cả cái tóc giả mình đội trên đầu Và thêm ba cái ria nữa Never felt sexier Now it's the time for the hair totally feel like a change man now so if you want experiences for yourself why don't you come down here and have a look for yourself you know some wig and makeup are not going to kill you so thanks for watching this edition of time out and until next time for taking 30 minutes today for Expert Living. Please write to us at expertliving at vtv.vn. We'd love to hear what you think about the stories you've seen here today. Or you can watch repeats of the show at vtv4.vn or youtube.com slash vtv4go. Once again, thank you very much for being here with us. My name's Lenning and I see you back soon.